Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Samantak Das, Professor of Comparative Literature at Jadavpur University, Calcutta. And this paper is called Reading New Literatures in English. The title of this module is Queer Discourses and the New Literatures in English and it has been prepared by Professor Saidul Haq of the Tehatta Government College, Kalyani University. Now, new literatures, as we know, is an umbrella term that incorporates the rich literary productions of a geographically and culturally diverse area, encompassing basically the former British colonies. And new literatures are marked by plurality, heterogeneity, and polyvalence. New literatures can be seen as searching for identities, which were long denied by the colonialist project. New literatures are then political in nature and constantly negotiate with power structure or structures. New literatures can be said to represent the voices coming from the marginalized and minority groups who were denied agency by the structures such as patriarchy, heteronormativity, colonialism, neocolonialism, race, caste and so on. New literatures explore the voices of women, queer, colonized, proletariat, racially segregated, blacks, Latinos, hyphenated diasporic groups, I mean basically all kinds of marginalized and neglected people. As far as queer discourses are concerned, around the 1970s, feminist theory started theorizing gender as a social identity fabricated and designed and perpetuated by social institutions rather than being something which is innate to our bodies and the way in which human bodies work. Kate Millett in her book Sexual Politics published in 1969 argued that sex is biological but gender is essentially a social construct. Michel Foucault in The History of Sexuality published in three volumes between 1976 and 1984 shifted sexuality from the domain of the body to the domains of discourse and culture. Judith Butler in Gender Trouble written in 1990 argues that gender is a performative construct. That is to say that it is performed in her words and I quote, there is no gender identity behind the expressions of gender that identity is performatively constituted by the way expressions, by the very expressions and the way in these expressions are performed, which are said to be its results. The subject is not something that is stable, fixed or preordained. Rather, it is through the subject's various acts and performances that the subject constitutes reality. Gender identity is therefore not fixed and the conventional binary opposition of masculine, feminine, male, female, straight, queer is also socially and politically constructed. Queer discourse sensitizes and interrogates, that is to say asks questions about, the popular cultural representations of gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, as aberrant or deviant figures. It questions the labeling of these as aberrant or deviant. Queer discourse, in other words, destabilizes essentializing identities and deconstructs the so-called naturalness and normalness of heterosexuality, which is often called heteronormativity. Queer discourse challenges the compulsory heterosexuality that is structured around the patriarchal trope of marriage and the perpetuation of male-dominated institutions like the family, kinship, religion. The crisscrossing of queer discourse and new literatures is not merely limited to the search for sexual identity, which as we have seen is not fixed. The crisscrossing of queer discourse and new literatures are based on, predicated on common concerns about the problematic of racial, ethnic and cultural identities. Judith Halberstam in her book, In a Queer Time and Place, Transgender Bodies, Subcultural Lives, published in 2005, 
argues that queer subcultures, and I'm quoting, produce alternative temporalities by allowing their participants to believe that their futures can be imagined according to logics that lie outside of those paradigmatic markers of life experience, birth, marriage, reproduction, death, unquote. Uh, so Halberstam basically detaches queerness from sexual identity and imagines spaces inhabited by diasporic peoples and nations with a colonial past of oppression. For her, these spaces follow a non-normative temporality, which she terms queer time. So they are outside of the typical kind of constructions of time that we have. And these are opposed to the normative timeline, which is, and I quote her again, upheld by a middle class logic of reproductive temporality. She argues and suggests that the discourse of queerness, and I quote again, has the potential to open up new life narratives and alternative relations to time and space. Anna Marie Jagos, she's Australian, states that the queer project is critical of all those versions of identity, community, and politics that evolve naturally and resist whatever is constituted as normal. In fact, these two words, natural and normal, will come back over and over again when one is talking of the politics of queerness. Queer narratives in new literatures therefore grapple with the dominant constructions of identity and heteronormative operations of power. As far as the Anglo-American conceptualization of queer discourse is concerned, we find a homogenizing impulse. That is to say, uh, there is a tendency to turn everything into the same boxes, as it were, to fit them into the same categories. And David Halperlin suggests that the idea of homosexuality and heterosexuality are fundamentally modern and Western productions predicated on the presence of a certain kind of bourgeois society. And in the Western imagination, as we know, the Orient, that is, you know, the place that we inhabit, is often constructed as a land of sexual difference, including, most importantly, promiscuity. But Ruth Vanita and Salim Kidwai's book, Same Sex Love in India, Readings in Indian Literature, 2000, argues that Indian society, and I'm quoting, Indian society rarely provided institutions that allowed it to be chosen and lived out as primary in refusal of marriage, even though it was romanticized and to some degree encouraged. So this same-sex love is not something which was considered to be natural even in the Indian context, so outside of Western bourgeois notions of normativity. Homosexuality in India was neither a Western import, therefore, nor an Oriental vice that needed colonial intervention. Besides this, the homosexuals from the colonized races were doubly marginalized, unlike homosexuals of the Western countries. These homosexuals, who were already different in their own cultures, had to negotiate with multiple oppressions because of their racial, economic, and sexual difference which is not just difference, but characterized as inferiority. In the post-colonial situation, there is a serious crossover between queer theory and conceptions of the post-colonial. The editors of the special issue, What's Queer About Queer Studies Now, of the journal Social Text, 2005, call for the implementation of the Spivakian approach, uh, referring to Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, the Spivakian approach to develop a firm understanding of queer as a political metaphor without a fixed referent. In other words, to be queer is to be political, but not necessarily confined to one single identity or position. And that's where we come to the politics of representation. The representation of queer issues and the politics of this representation in a few texts from new literatures in English will, I think, illustrate what I'm trying to say. Let us begin with a 
uh, text written in 1965, uh, Wole Shoinka's The Interpreters. In, in The Interpreters, the appearance of Joe Golder, an African American who is also homosexual, demands critical intervention. The otherization of the homosexual character in the novel then occurs through different modes. The otherization of the homosexual uh, occurs in different ways in the novel, including uh, through the constant attempt on part of the colonized races to debunk their stereotyping as effeminate and to present a masculine image of their race. Homosexuality during the colonial period in Africa, but also in India, was shunned very strongly because the homosexual was seen as somehow not male enough. It is also quite telling that in the novel, the homosexual character is racially hybrid and different from other Africans. He is, in other words, an outsider. This otherization of race and the otherization of the sexual, sexually deviant or aberrant happen simultaneously in Shoinka's novel. Um, Having looked at an African text, let us now turn to an Asian text, Sham Salvadurai's Funny Boy, published um, about three decades after Shoinka in 1994, which recounts the gay childhood and adolescence of Arji Shelvaratnam amidst the Tamil Sinhala interethnic conflict in Sri Lanka, of which we are only too aware in India. Now, Within Funny Boy, there is something which one might characterize as the politics of space. Now, in, uh, in the novel, while the other boys play cricket in the front garden, the girls are relegated to the territory near the kitchen. This is again a very typical heterosexualist division of the inner and the outer, the outer belonging to the male and the inner belonging to the female. And while Ariji is supposed to inhabit the first space because he is male, biologically male, that is to say the male space of the outside, he transgresses this norm and aligns himself with the second, that is to say the so-called feminine or feminized space near the kitchen. Rather than play the masculine and indeed colonial game of cricket, he is comfortable playing the feminine, more interiorized game of bride-bride. Gayatri Gop Gopinath, in her book Impossible Desires, 2005, suggested that, and I quote, Arije's performance of queer femininity radically reconfigures hegemonic nationalist and diasporic logic, which depends on the figure of the woman as a stable signifier of tradition. And, and here I would like to point out that it is women who have been seen in the heteronormative uh, mode as the carriers and the bearers of tradition, not least because it is women who give birth to the individuals who will carry on what constitutes any certain identity. So in an interesting note, Arije comments that in the hierarchy of bride bride, the person with the least importance, less even than the priest and the page boys, was the groom. It was a role we considered stiff and boring that held no attraction for any of us. And the marginalization of the groom figure unsettles the concept of heterosexual marriage. The groom, being the representative of traditional patriarchy, also gets less attention, which is quite metaphoric uh, and a challenge to patriarchy within, que within queer discourse. There is a constant patriarchal policing of Arije to rid him of his deviant, abnormal effeminacy. He is forced to play cricket, he is provided male company like Jagan, and finally enrolled in the Queen Victoria Academy, an all-male public school on the British model and note also the colonial implications of the name, the Queen Victoria Academy. Both the trope of cricket and the public school are vestiges of a colonial past. Interestingly, both the heteronormative institutions of patriarchy and colonialism are equally hegemonic in nature because effeminacy and empire always stand in opposition 
and not just opposition, but very often violent opposition. But this homosocial space of the male school, and there's a paradox here, because on the one hand, one is attacking uh, anything which is uh, different from heteronormativity, yet as we know, the public school is a space inhabited by members of a single sex and you know, gender, if you like. So it's a homosocial space. And the homosocial space of the male school then becomes a subversive space. When Arije builds a homosexual relationship with his classmate Shehan within the premises of the school. And according to a critic, the colonial patriarchal enterprise of becoming a man is square to reclaim the homosocial realm and re-signify it as a homosexual space. And moreover, uh, the, the, the relationship between these two boys is also one means of overcoming the ethnic conflict between uh, the Sinhala and the Tamil, to which I will return in a moment. Uh, while in Shoinka's interpreters, there was a simultaneous otherization of queer and racial identity, and it did not accommodate any other in its vicinity. Selvadurai's novel is more accommodative. Arije, who is Tamil, has a queer romance with Shehan, who belongs to the major Sinhala uh, group, and his disloyalty to Tamil ethnicity is shown when he intentionally, make, intentionally makes a mess of the poem he recites which is assigned to him by the principal called Black Tie, who expresses solidarity with Tamil identity. And he misrecites the poem, if I may be allowed to say so, in a school program and thereby challenges the ethnic polarization of the nation. The novelist also facilitates a bond between queer subjects and marginal others like Radha Aunty, his mother, Daryl Uncle and Jagan, who are subordinated in terms of gender, race, or class. Towards the end of the novel, Arjee's emigration to Canada invites uh, an interpretation which is difficult and perhaps somewhat ambiguous. A novel which continuously engages with querying homosocial spaces and normative identities fails to give shelter to Arjee. Why the trope of getting instated in a white land. Is the white country, the white western country, more emancipating than the homeland of the post-colonial nation state? This signifies another kind of marginality, a South Asian migrant in a white land with his sexual deviance and marginality. But at the same time, Arjay's remarks about the family signals a different kind of interpretation. And I quote, I was no longer a part of the family in the same way. I now inhabited a world they didn't understand and to which they couldn't follow me. He's now imagining a cosmopolitan space, a non-national space driven by queer time, a space which is free from the heteronormative structures of the family, the nation and identity. Let me turn now to <clears throat> an Indian writer, uh, not a novelist this time, but a playwright, whom I'm sure many of you will have read, Mahesh Dattani. Um, and Mahesh Dattani's recurrent portrayals of homosexual characters in his plays makes him a very, very important figure in South Asian queer culture. And I would argue, not just in queer culture, but in all the various ways in which cultural forms challenge different kinds of norms, whether they be of gender, race, class, caste, religion, or ethnicity. The homosexual relationships in Dattani's plays are interesting because of their protagonists' relationships, or if you like, affairs, beyond their immediate class. For instance, Nitin's sexual desire for the rickshaw puller in Bravely for the Queen, 1991, Alpesh's sexual entanglement with the gardener of the family in Do the Needful, 97, and Kamalesh's sexual relationship with the security guard of his flat in Honor Muggy Night in Mumbai, 98, 
and a hijra's relationship with a government minister's son in Seven Steps Round the Fire, 1998, are all potential sites to interrogate the links between being queer and the identity which can also be a barrier of class. But all of these potentially homosexual relationships are portrayed as marginal in the plays and seem driven by physical pleasure as is evident in the relationship between Kamlesh and the security guard. Kamlesh satisfies his sexual hunger with the guard and pays him money. The guard, being conscious of his identity as a gay person, replies no when asked by Kamlesh if he does this for money. But he immediately changes his view and says he does do this for money. Now what this does is it masks the, the, the guard's gay identity and allows him to pretend that he does it not because of his sexual orientation but because of his class need to make some extra cash. The relationship therefore does not seem to be built on genuine emotional bonds. It becomes in the final analysis a financial transaction where you pay for pleasure. The only central theme of a homoerotic relationship between the hijra and the minister's son ends in a tragic and indeed catastrophic finale with the planned murder of the hijra in the play Seven Steps Around the Fire. Um, in Dattani's On a Muggy Night in Mumbai, we have an entire community of homosexuals. This play highlights the performativity of gender. Prakash slash Ed wants to gain advantage by marrying Kiran, who is incidentally his gay partner's sister, because this mask of heterosexual normative marriage will enable him to be closer to his homoerotic partner, that is Kamlesh. Similarly, Bunny, in a popular serial, Ye Hai Hamara Parivar, and you note the, the, the um, connotations of Parivar, especially now, acts as an ideal husband and father, even though in real life he is a homosexual man. Kiran explains, exclaims, pardon me, you are an ideal husband and father. I can't imagine anyone else in that part. The irony, as well as the subversive force, works together as heteronormative words like parivar, husband and father are enacted by someone who actually is opposed to all of these terms. Coming now to a more contemporary work, uh, the story Crocodile Tears by R. Raj Rao, which is about a relationship between the editor of a publishing company and Ashutosh, the typesetter of the publishing house. I want you to note again the disjuncture, the disparity between the class positions of the two protagonists. From the beginning, this relationship is structured around a certain kind of hierarchy because Ashutosh is not only a subordinate in the office, but is financially dependent upon the editor. Like the hierarchization in a heteronormative family, queer relationships are also driven by power, something which becomes evident when we consider the plays of Dattani or this story by R. Raj Rao. Um, in terms of queerness where women are concerned, <clears throat> let, me, let me talk a little bit about lesbian desire. Uh, Ruth Vanita identifies the 19th century as, quote, the crucial period of transition when a minor strand of pre-colonial homophobia became the dominant voice in colonial and post-colonial mainstream discourse, unquote. While nationalists tried to present a masculine, virile image of men to counter the effeminate tag given by their colonial masters, things happened somewhat differently for women. Partha Chatterjee has theorized a distinction created by the nationalists. As opposed to the public sphere controlled by men, and, and you note we've, we've already seen this in uh, Selvadurai's uh, novel, as opposed to the public sphere controlled by men, they constructed, they, by they I mean the nationalists, constructed a private space of home uncontaminated and immune to the corrupt influence of the West 
and the colonial masters. This home as the sanctum sanctorum, a space is feminine and the woman as a griha lakshmi, the goddess of the home, uh, dominated or as it were uh, blessed this space. This was not so much a physical as a spiritual space, synonymous with asexuality and only sanctioned procreative sexuality. So in the outer world is the male domain, the inner world is the space of the Griha Lakshmi who is not supposed to possess any sexual desire and the only sex or the only sexual relations that are sanctioned are meant to produce offspring. Any transgression from this mythic construction of a sanitized version of womanhood was always dismissed as bizarre and deviant. Gayatri Gopinath argues, either the queer woman is erased from a patriarchal nationalist rhetoric that refuses her existence, or she is colonized by a liberalist Western discourse of sexuality that seeks to codify her subjectivity through indexes of gay or lesbian. And this is where Lihaf, the quilt by Ismat Shuktai, 1942, which incidentally is the oldest text I'll be discussing, uh, becomes important. Lihaf, or the quilt, is narrated through the perspective of an innocent nine-year-old girl where the same-sex relations between Begum Jan and her maid Rabbo is shrouded within several circles of enclosure, quite literally. The quilt, the veil, and the zenana, the inner realm where women are supposed to exist. Every night, the child witnesses the shaking quilt with terror, and the tale ends with the child narrator's refusal to admit what she saw when the quilt was lifted. So what was under the quilt is not literally not seen by this innocent child. The denial of disclosure and the negation of reality towards the end of the story are symptomatic of the problem of locating and codifying queer discourse in the new literatures in English. Against the homogenizing impulse of Western discourses of queerness, the new literatures in English strive to accommodate queer discourses. The challenges they face are the problems of naming queer desire with some kind of authentically indigenous flavor. In Selvadura's Funny Boy, the repeated use of the adjective funny to define Arjee's homosexuality by the adults signifies the deficiency of English to incorporate local versions or variations of same-sex desire. It is significant to note here Ruth Vanita's observation that the presence of words describing same-sex desire between women in pre-colonial pre Indian texts as in uh, the Rakthi genre in Urdu poetry is absent in colonial and post-colonial discourse. In Anita Nair's Ladies' Coupe, <coughs> which is set in the ladies' compartment of a train, all the women passengers share their stories and generate a homosocial bonding. Uh, the story of Marie Kolantu comes at the end, but leads to a complex problem of lesbian desire. Uh, Marie Kolantu builds an intimate relationship with Sujata, the daughter-in-law of the aristocratic household where she works. Once again, you note the uh, intersection of class and gender and sexuality. But Sujata breaks the relationship when she comes to know that Marikolantu has simultaneously seduced her husband, Sridhar. It is interesting to know that both the women hold on to their heterosexual privileges whilst having a homosexual affair. Same-sex relationships are portrayed as not self-sufficient enough to challenge heterosexual desire in the novel. And there is again, of course, the problematic of naming this kind of desire. What do you call it? What name do you give it? Marie Kolantu only comes to terms with her desire when she views Missy K and Missy V's homoerotic bonding long after her own affair. Sujata too fails to name their desire as she considers it as something supernatural, which is, as you know, one way of removing something from the here and now and the human realm. And I quote, I know you used black magic to make me your slave. 
make me do things no woman would. But not anymore. It won't work anymore. In conclusion, we can say that the representation of queer discourse, or perhaps it would be better to say queer discourse says in the plural, in the new literatures in English is certainly not monolithic. There are significant differences. Whereas gay literature is generally associated with larger issues of the outside, the public, lesbian writings seem to be centered more around desire inside the home, although there are exceptions. And I want to pause here to point out that the old patriarchal division of the home and the world, if you like, the home belonging to the women and the world belonging to men, seems to be perhaps somewhat tragically working itself out even when it comes to the discourse of queerness. Well, queer writings from South Asia are more about the problematic of class and caste. New queer literatures from other parts of the world are more concerned with racial and ethnic issues, something that becomes apparent when one considers Wole Shoinka's novel to that of uh, Sham Selvadurai or the short stories that we have discussed. One thread that connects and appropriates the study of queer discourses in new literatures is their negotiation with identity at a time which can be called transitional or crisis laden or transgressive. These are moments when, the, when things fall apart, as it were, when one is moving from one space time to another space time, when there is some kind of a crisis or when one deliberately steps across boundaries and fences that have been erected to keep identities separate. So these moments of transition, these moments of crisis, these moments of transgression are very important in queer literature. As opposed to the idea of a linear triumphalist view of hegemonic heteronormativity, the queer constructs are labyrinthine, circuitous, and these discourses of the body are symptomatic of the polyvalence found in new literatures. In other words, new literatures cannot be summed up with a sort of list of characteristics that are there. There are many things there and very often they sort of circle back on themselves. They are not easy to interpret because they offer no easy kinds of messages. In its constant desire to transgress, to redefine and to undefine, to defer meaning, to defy closure or disclosure, to mask and unmask, to challenge meanings, this kind of queer discourse, or perhaps as I've said, we should say queer discourses, makes this body of work within the new literatures even more interesting. Thank you.